I mean, that was the first thing that I looked at actually when you when you reached out. I was like, how many episodes does this guy have? <laughs> yeah, what are we at now? Ninety two, I yeah. think. Oh, yeah, this guy's legit. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I really appreciate you being willing to come on because I've been following your work for a very long time now. And again, you're just a person I find really inspirational. You work incredibly hard. You set the example for others, and you're you're paving a path for others to be proud of their community. So would you mind first starting out with a brief introduction of yourself, um, your community, uh, and your name? Everyone, I, uh, I come from the Sequim Territory. Williams Lake First Nation is the community that I'm the chief of, and uh, we're located in the interior of British Columbia. If you're unfamiliar with this equipment territory, it ranges right from the north here in Williams Lake all the way down to the Kootenays uh, in the south. So, I mean, there's, of course, some boundary issues like there are in every single nation probably in this country. So I'm sure the Tunaha have a dispute to be made and the Yokotin have a dispute to be made and the Dekef have a dispute to be made. But uh, the key thing is, is that historically that was our territory and uh, holding it up in the way that we do it, the way that we conduct businesses is how we do it here at WLFN. So appreciative of the invite and, and just happy to be here today. It's uh, my pleasure. Would you mind describing what it means to come from your community? We know that the territories range, the traditions range, and I'm just curious, from your perspective, what does it mean to be from your community? What are some of the highlights that stand out to you? Yeah, I mean, really blessed here at WLFN, in my opinion. We have a great location located outside the city of Williams Lake, uh, right along a major highway corridor, resource-based economy. It's mining, it's ranching, it's forestry. You know, we have Enbridge in the territory, uh, Pembina pipelines, natural gas pipelines. But, uh, you know, looking at you know, who we are as a people historically and, and how we embrace, you know, that resource-based economy and finding the balance between uh, being stewards of the land, but then uh, also at the same time creating these revenue streams and providing opportunity due to our membership to provide for their families. In an era you know, where you know, we aren't just living off of the land anymore, we're finding that balance most or even our family circles. I, I feel pretty blessed. You know, We have a location that isn't overpopulated. We have access to every biogeoclimatic zone within an hour of Williams Lake. So, Sorry, could you describe that a little bit? Yeah, so so we have access to deserts. We have access to rainforests, grasslands. I mean, you name it. Within an hour, we have access to it here at WLFN. Uh, you could be out of cell service within 30 minutes and out on the land. And that's uncommon in today's world. Uh, you know, the beauty of the territory and having an opportunity to get out on the land and help ourselves find that balance is uh, is a way that we grew up, you know. And I look at, you know, how blessed we are to be from an area, to be born in an era that we are, and um, and, and people take it for granted. And I, I truly do believe that you get down into the city, and I remember how exciting the city used to be when I was a kid get down you see the big buildings and there's just so much stuff and so many stores and they like stuff to do but then you like try and travel five blocks and uh, find a parking spot and uh and you get frustrated really quickly and it's just overwhelming as you get older you start to realize just, just you know how gorgeous and how lucky we are to be from the caribou jokoden from sequet mulu from the city of williams lake and the, and that's you know what we need to instill in our youth as well you know we want them to get out there and see the world but we also want them to do, make sure that they realize how good they have it here in Williams like just how beautiful the region we live in we see that more and more as people start to you know, sell their properties and move back into these rural communities because it is not only affordable but it is just a better quality of life I couldn't agree more. And I think that interconnectedness is something that so many people are missing out on. I think the land has so many lessons to teach people about balance, about responsibility, about the power that a storm can have. There's just a lot to take away from it. And it's 
it's humbling and it seems like that's a piece that so many people are missing right now when you're not near a giant city and you don't have all of that light pollution you see the stars and you understand how small you are when you're out in the forest and you hear a bear or you hear a cougar you understand how vulnerable you are and i think it's really important that we seek that out in healthy ways obviously don't go looking uh, to find a bear but have a connection with nature and the land and hopefully that will humble you and give you a greater appreciation for what it means to be alive totally i mean you look at creative and exciting ways to get out in the land in the summer you know even in the winter but i'll use summer as an example you know the kids get off school and we get to the house and it's like yeah we want to go fishing down the creek it's five minutes you know we're ripping trout out we're um we're uh, hooking uh, uh, sucker fish and, and it's fishing season down at the river. It's, it's 30 minutes. And we got sockeye salmon in the pit. You know, we want to go hunt for some deer. It's a 20 minute walk up the hill and we have access to this massive uh, forest range and, and, and crown land and, and reserve land that, uh, you know, in the, in the city or in these more urban centers, you don't. And, I think that it is a pretty important part of, you know, how we want to raise our, our kids, but, you know, give them those teachings and, and that's a big part of, you know, being indigenous is being able to continue to tell that story. And I, I just think about the way that I was raised and, and, and my dad, he went to residential school over at St. Joseph's Mission. Uh, my grandma passed away when I was really young and so did my grandpa on my dad's side. I never got any of that. You know, it was, it was not until I got a little bit older that I was able to understand the importance of it. And, and it was uncles and it was friends that took me under their wing and actually showed that to me. And now I'm in a position where I can teach my kids that and that's the way that they're being raised. Uh, it is such an important part of our balance as indigenous people to hold up those traditions and hold up that culture. But at the same time, I mean, it's a tech world we live in. I mean, we're in a podcast right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my kids know what podcasts are. It's just so bizarre. And making sure that we we are grounded and, and we, we make sure that we're focusing on that balance moving forward and passing those teaching down is, is just so important. We can't understand it at all. That's why, again, I mean, you go back to you know, just how blessed we are to be from where we are here in Williams Lake. I mean, we still have high-speed internet. <laughs> can, you t- can you talk about it seems like the lack of access to your stories and culture inspired you to want to protect that for your children would you be able to talk about how maybe we think that just an un, like having full access would be perfect but it seems like you're more protective of it you're more understanding of the value of it because maybe you had less access to it so you see the value in a different way would you mind just talking about how that's sort of shaped your understanding? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a, a household. It was like one of those radical households. So I remember getting up as a kid and my parents would be sitting around the dinner table uh, having coffee and and shooting, you know, having conversation about how corrupt the band was, you know, how corrupt council was, how, you know, many things were doing wrong, how, you know, just unbalanced our, our leadership in, in our community. And I remember thinking to myself, like, okay, all they talk about is how bad chief and council is. But I mean, none of them were on council or whatever run for council. And it was, it was challenge for me to wrap my head around, but right away it was instilled in me that in order to make a difference in my community, I'm going to have to be in one of these leadership positions. Uh, so, you know, I was raised by my mom non-indigenous person in the indigenous community she did her best to teach us the culture and hold up you know who we are as equipment but i mean not growing up in that world herself it was very challenging but you know some things that she did instill in me were hard work you know the value of, of finding a career and and you know just those tools that make you a good human and I'll be forever grateful for her for that. She didn't teach me about my culture and she didn't teach me my language and she didn't teach me about the ceremonies. She tried her best, but she instilled those other tools that 
made me who I am today. And I will be honestly forever grateful for that. So as I progressed through, you know, being a young person, going to post-secondary, and just figuring out life, I still had in the back of my mind that I wanted to be in one of these leadership positions. I got elected in young, 23. I did 10 years on council before being elected in this chief in 2018. And, um, and now I'm currently in my second term. So the what we've been able to do during the course of my time in leadership, and again, I've been blessed in leadership. I have always been a part of a very you know progressive and supportive council uh the the chief at the time my entire time in leadership until i became the chief was ann louie you know one of my mentors in life she uh she sits back on council now and keeps me on my toes but you know making sure that we were doing those little changes throughout our time in leadership that are going to make a difference it was always on the was always a topic of discussion even to this day everybody wants it to happen you know like that and that is this misconception that indigenous communities have and really canadians have about you know these leadership positions in this in our communities and in this country is that i mean it's easy it'll happen overnight well i mean there's a lot of work that goes into for example we're sitting in this brand new administration building that we built it was Anne's vision to build this building but it probably took us you know four years of prep and then another two years of construction to do it. You know, um, we want to build a new uh, rec center, community center in, in a cultural center. Well, I mean, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it and said, well, we'll break ground in the spring. You know, that's what the community, I've had comments like that. And it's just like, well, it's going to take us at minimum a year and a half of, of prep and planning. And then we have to build it, which is going to be another two years. Um, People start thinking about that, like, oh, shoot, well, I thought we could just build it. You know, things don't happen like that. And like our culture department, that was, as we build that out, we're starting to see this cool revitalization of our songs and of that language. And it's because these champions in the community are like taking it and running with it. We're building this cultural department to help, you know, support and, and, and to help, you know, incubate. But it's, those individuals that are seeing that, that are getting inspired, that are really running with it, that that we're seeing this, this uptake in in that revitalization process. Uh, the the biggest part of I guess my lessons growing up is things don't happen overnight. They take time, and we have to be patient. And that's a lesson on its own. But the key thing is just to not get frustrated um, because it's not happening quick enough. I just had a discussion actually with my son last night, uh, big hockey guy, 15. And um, you know, we stayed after practice. I, I let him come to our senior men's practice. And it's late and he's just super fired up about it. But we stayed after practice while we're working on the one timers. And he's like, not getting, and he's getting frustrated. But he's getting some on the net and he's getting some hard. And we're on the way home and he's just like, I suck and I'm the worst. It's like, no, man, I'm just trust the process you know you ain't gonna get a perfect one-timer overnight and uh, any nhl or any good hockey player will attest to that put the work in and trust the process uh please just don't get frustrated when they're killing me and kids don't want to hear that but it's funny to me i laughed about it as he went to bed um because i I know where he's coming from and uh, i understand you just hope that you know as you build these humans in your lives build out these these kids that have to grow up to be good people that you're doing a good job there ain't no playbook around that stuff it's really it's really easy to point the finger at people uh to be frustrated at the federal government provincial government municipal government indigenous government systems and to just put the blame on them and to say we don't have these things because people are awful they're they're not fair they're getting paid off there's all these perverse incentives it's easy to stay there and you see people get stuck there. What inspired you to say, I could be that difference. I could change the system. I could participate and make the system better in some way. Because if everybody in the room is saying that chief and councils this type of way and we can't trust them and they're bad people, it takes a certain level of independence and confidence in yourself to say, no, I think I could do something here. I think I could contribute in some way. Yeah, and I mean, I get all the glory and I get all the criticism, you know, and council does as well. But, I mean, we were only as good as our staff. 
but that'll be awesome. And you know, all the successes that we've had over the past 15 years, you know, over the past 10 years, over the past five years has been because of that staff that we have. And, and, and that was tough to understand too. I was talking to a former chief or multiple former chiefs and, you know, always the story was in their time, they were the social worker, they were the rec manager, they were, they were the lawyer and in today's day and age and in the system that we have here and again it's not perfect and every community is different obviously but i mean we have a unbelievable health team great finance team our administration is, is far none uh we have a hunting tire rec department you know we're able to do these things because of the own source revenue that we bring in and you know offset funding that we get from isk but you know when when i sit at the front and, and, and we're getting, you know, the praise from, from everybody on what we're doing. I mean, a big part of our success is acknowledging the work that's being done by everybody else. Like I was telling you before in the podcast, we, uh, we're hosting the new Hulk tonight. We are repatriating a, uh, totem pole from the Royal British Columbia Museum back to their homelands of Bella Coola. And, uh, and it's a massive deal. We offered up to host a feast in WLFN to honor what they're doing and give our community an opportunity to go and be a part of this history making. We'll repeat trading uh, our culture and our history back to our communities is a massive part of this healing journey that we're on as a country. And you know, bringing back those feasts, I, I thought that was pretty cool, but we have our culture coordinator in here. And he has everything ready to go, you know. He's got you know, the the ceremony ready. You know, the elders are queued up and uh, excited, and and how everything is going to go today. You know, I I can do that. Like I I I couldn't you know be that cultural leader, um, because I just don't know how. And and that's a key part. Like the humility piece, I think, is a big part of, of being in these leadership roles. Is is understanding what you're good at and and understanding you know when to ask for help, uh, and, and that is a crutch in some indigenous communities where we just try and do too much and we burn ourselves out. So a big part of it, of course, is is as well finding that balance. For me, the balance is different. I play a lot of hockey, and um, some people critique me for it, but you know I, I I wouldn't be of level mind if I didn't have an outlet of some sort. But then there's also other things like, um, you know, getting into the sweat, picking up my drum, learning new songs. These are all parts of it. You know, holding my newborn baby and making him laugh, uh, finding time for those things as well is, is a big part of it. So, you know, when you talk about decision making in community and being the difference, it's acknowledging that we have this amazing team and that we're doing it together, not as a single person. I think that that's really important because it is bigger than you and you being able to find your role in all of this helps others kind of see a path and it's exhausting when you're misinterpreted or misunderstood or a decision isn't pointed out properly. Mm -hmm. How does hockey impact your ability to, to keep going? Because it sounds like you've gotten maybe some negativity towards that, but you need a team behind you that supports you, but you also need to feel inspired and feel refreshed and renewed when you're going into a long day of Zoom meetings and interviews and, and all the work that goes into a day. How does hockey play a role in that? Yeah, I mean, it is a part of the balance where I'm able to get into that room with the boys, laugh and joke, get onto the ice and, and participate in a physical activity and, and let loose of you know, all of that stress and frustration and any anger that you have. I mean, the amount of time that I dedicate to uh, getting on the ice is, you know, where you know, I, I get it sometimes, but, you know, it, it's something that, that I need because we're always, you know, like, honestly, there, there's a ton of praise, but there's a lot of critique too. And that, that's not unfamiliar in indigenous communities. Everybody's pointing the finger. But what's going wrong or you know only hearing one side of the story and immediately throwing blame and shade and and it is what it is we signed up for these positions and and we could take it but you know we didn't even know let every once in a while and uh 
you know, big part of it. Again, hockey, but getting out of the land is a big one too. Like I was saying, picking up that drum, listening to the songs and doing those things. You know, it's a, it's a tough position, these political spots. And if we don't make sure that we are balanced in our approach to them, then we will burn ourselves out. And once we're burnt out and tired and stressed, and I mean, what good are we to our community in those instances? Yeah, and then you get jaded. I joined council in September, and you want to be able to keep that vision that you came in with. And it was very important to me to run on a real platform of saying what I was going to do so that at the end of the term, I could say whether or not I had met the goals that I had set out, but also to make sure that I remain positive and inspirational because the reason that some people get so frustrated is because they don't know what the vision is. They don't know where they're going. They don't know if things are going to be better in five years or 10 years or if things are going to be the same. And I think one thing you were mentioning earlier is like things take time and it's tough because for First Nations communities, it's different than a municipality in that often if you're a municipality, you have maybe a rec center and then you're like, well, let's upgrade that rec center to something better in 10 years. Where for a First Nation community, it's often... We don't have a rec center. We've never had a rec center. And we really, really want a rec center. And so telling somebody it's going to be six years is not something people get excited about because they're like, that's my kids are going to be grown up. That's too far away. That's that's not going to help today. What's going to help today? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's such a challenge to navigate those conversations because you want to continue to inspire them because they're going to be working there. Maybe their kids will be attending there. You want to keep that investment, even if you don't see it tomorrow or next week. Yeah, I mean, this is the challenging thing about our communities. There's this misconception, not only in our communities, but also in the general public that ISC funds everything that we do. You know, we don't have to pay anything because the government pays for it. Well, we have over 90 staff here at WLFN, 50% of which is covered by ISC. So Indigenous Services Canada. You know, the rest is covered through own source revenue. You know, so, hey, we don't have a rec department. Oh, well, that's fully funded own source revenue. Oh, hey, we don't have a culture department. No, fully funded. Okay, you know, an elders crew, a, um, an after school program, a daycare. I mean, you go down the list of things that we provide through the revenue streams that we bring in by working collaboratively and creating partnerships and building businesses. And, and this is the balance that I always you know, talk about with the elders. Well, I know you're against that pipeline project. Or I know you're against that mine operating in our territory, but we inherited those resources into our territory, you know, into, into our, our world. Would I support a brand new mine in the territory? Uh, not likely, but I mean, existing mines and existing pipelines, I mean, we should be seeing some sort of benefit from, from them because we need to pay for all the things that we want to do. You know, the healing of our community. We put over 400K into our uh, Powell Arbor last year. You know, talk about you know a, a renovation that is instilling pride into the community. You know, that money came from our relationship with Mount Pauli Mine and the renewed impact benefit agreement that we have. And and, and that's a tough balance to have and a tough discussion to have with, with, with our elders and, and with some of our grassroots movement people because it's not something that they can get behind. But at the same time, they want better services for their families. And and that's a balance that we need to find. I mean, it's tough. And those are tough discussions to have. But uh, again, I mean, communication is key to success in these instances and making sure that the community, the voices are being heard when they're bringing it forward and that we are listening is, uh, is also a key part of that. I mean, a lot of the time membership wants to know be able to voice their opinion we can't hold them down in doing that sometimes uh you know uh, we we don't see eye to eye but it's how we move forward as a as a collective that is, is, is going to see the benefit for future generations i have these discussions all the time you know well i i don't agree but you know i'm listening and um and finding compromises it's tough you know the balance of compromises in indigenous communities like you're saying, you want it to be like a municipality or a provincial government, but I mean, the reality, every community member has access to the chief in some way or form, has access to the council in some way or form. Uh, <laughs> and they'll, they'll make sure to, to, to exercise that when the time comes and, 
and they want to voice their opinion on things. Who are we to say, no, sorry, not today. Um, go through, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. Yeah, and it breaks my heart because we're often put in a circumstance that others aren't, which is you have to often choose between poverty and investing in things that are going to improve the socioeconomic position of the membership. And I'm a huge believer in that it is not fair to make communities in these circumstances choose between extracting natural resources and poverty. Like, that's just an untenable, there's there's a no-win situation there. But I think you have to prioritize people's right to have a quality life, clean water, a warm home during the winter, a cool home during the summer, like basic things that aren't even a question two blocks from my community are something that we're working towards and trying to improve. And there's a weight on our shoulders as Indigenous people of like, we don't want to harm the land, but we can't live in these circumstances and we can't continue to burn wood and we can't continue to rely on like poor fuel sources in order to survive for the benefit of others when they don't have to make that same decision. I mean, everyone has a cell phone or a tablet or, you know, a computer, drives vehicles, you know, turns the heat up, you know, has fresh water. I mean, these things we take, these amenities, we take them for granted nowadays. And, uh, you know, how we get them is through, you know, pipelines and resource extraction and, and, and it's just a reality of the, the life that we live. I mean, I'm not saying push them all through and, and support them all, but I'm saying just make sure that we have a seat at the table so that we know what's going on and making sure that you know, we educate our community on the impacts that are happening or could potentially happen and how we're getting in front of them you know, with our partners and, and being that actual environmental stewards of the, of the land and of the territory. Um, you know, not easy discussions to have, of course, but necessary. I'm interested, what has it been like to move into this leadership position? Obviously, you had a vision of it from the outset, but what has it been like to be chief? Has it been more challenging than you expected? Was it more closely similar to what you expected? How much did things change when you were able to take on that position? Yeah, I mean, there's no uh, <clears throat> real job description for a chief position or a leadership position. There's a general idea. It really is what, what you make it. And again, uh, surrounded with great staff, but we also have a very progressive and supportive council at the same time. I mean, I was always of that mindset too. Things can happen overnight, but it doesn't work that way. You always have to be looking at you know, planning and, and preparing for the future and, and making sure that the staff is trained and the community is trained to uh, not react to emergencies in the community. I mean, we had a home burned down uh, over the weekend. And I mean, it, it was something else. It was uh, a family that has been severely impacted uh, with the, the death over the last three months and now their home burned down. Super sad. And what we've seen in that instance when the house lit up was that you know, the, the family was safe, the fire department on site right away, but our health team fully engaged, you know, put them up at a hotel, get them the, the clothing and the meds and a cell phone and all the things that they needed, you know, it, it just happened immediately because we're prepared for those things because we have such a great team here at WLF. You know, my biggest stress is honestly, are that we lose key staff biggest stress whole world losing our stars you know we're a bit of an anomaly that way in my opinion because not only have we been able to recruit talented individuals into this organization into this government but we've been able to retain them you know we're losing our cao uh one of our like superstars a guy by the name of Aaron manella you know he, he has turned a corner for us over the last three years that he's been here and um you know made this unbelievably great impact on our community and really changes the trajectory of, of our community for the good and you know, finding an individual to replace him super tough and I think we we found somebody that is going to be able to fill those shoes we have high hopes that same raw talent that same you know motivation 
indigenous female by the name of Courtney Cook, I'll name drop her. But I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing in, in, in these communities is, is, you know, keeping the ship down that path and down that vision we have as a leadership group, as chief and council, but just understanding again, and we talked about it already is that these things don't happen overnight and look at the amount of progress that we've had, you know, while I was on council over those 10 years, and then now as the chief over the past five years, it's been unbelievable progress been great it's been fun and exciting and and i'm honestly pumped to come to work every day you know i'm pumped to be in community be able to participate in those ceremonies and you know that's what you need to have on a day to day because um, here was real going to work every day and how are you going to be able to properly meet your people yeah you are a multi-talented individual and i think that that also inspires other people you're not just a great leader you do other things can you talk about dip netting with dad and writing a book and and sharing that because i think it just it's really important that people have different skill sets and different interests so that when they're doing one thing their mind can go to hockey or go to writing a book or move around so you're not feeling stagnant can you talk about that book yeah i have a couple books I, I always said I'm going to write about what I know best, and, and what I know best is Dick Nut Fishing. It's traditional form of fishing specific to British Columbia, where you have a 8 to 10 foot pole with a net on the end, and you dip it into the river and you know, scoop fish out. Uh, or, or, I mean, that's the way that we harvest. They're hockey, of course, and big hockey guy. So, I mean, that's what I wrote about in second Hockey with Dad and Dip Netting and Dad, both Canadian bestsellers. One was an award winner. I think award season is coming up for hockey, but I'm not 100%. And I wanted to be able to have a story that I could read to my kids specific to our region and our people at W. Elfin and Miss Quetmulu. I mean, that's where the, the, the vision came for those books. I remember I was searching high and low everywhere, every bookstore. And um, I, cu I couldn't find like a fun indigenous children's book. And there's a ton out there now, which is awesome. But uh, I finally just said, I remember I was having this discussion with my um, my ex-wife and it was just like, uh, well, why don't you write one? I said, well, well, fine, I will. And I found this really super talented uh, illustrator, a good friend of mine. And, and that's what really started the process of hockey with dad and dip knitting with dad. The best part of this entire, you know, journey as a indigenous author, um, in my opinion, was a book touring part of it. I mean, there's really not a ton of money in um, children's books, anyways. I mean, what are we at? I think I think we've sold over seven thousand copies of each book now, which is which is unbelievable. Thank you very much for everyone that bought the book. That's that's really cool. Uh, but the but you know, getting out in front of those schools and being able to share our story. You know, how do we share stories historically? Um, we shared them through oral oral storytelling or, or that's how we taught our lessons and in 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 getting back to that with with books and then getting out in front of these students and and, and presenting to these entire gymnasiums of, of kids in, in different districts across the province uh you know gave us a good handle and a good perspective on you know where the healing journey is at really in this in, in this country in my opinion, anyways. I mean, that first year we did 73 schools over eight weeks. It was so much fun. You know, there's this really neat uh, experience that we had on the island. They gave us um, the Vancouver Island, first of all, unbelievably gorgeous. Gorgeous territory. I mean, you know, you're from down in the lower mainland, but for anybody listening, you need to get a chance. I mean, they had they, the, the district that we went to is Lower Cowichan. They had a great handle on, uh, you know, that revitalization and, you know, that indigenous, non-indigenous partnership and in, in what reconciliation should look like before reconciliation even became a topic of discussion, really. And I remember we went to this French immersion school. You know, the school district gave us this handler, big indigenous man, a drum on his chest, big booming voice, you know. And uh, he sang this welcoming song, like every school that we went to. It was super cool. 
and we went to this French immersion school. I can't even remember where it was now, but um, we're standing at the front like we usually do, and we have this great presentation. It's about an hour long. We talk about the importance of storytelling, uh, the, the whole experience of catching fish and drawing them, and the family experience that comes with it, and community experience. And then Kev talks about how he illustrated the book and how he became an illustrator. It's, it's really good. It's really well done. Like, and then we were able to perfect it and work on our public speaking skills. But we're standing at the front of the school, and uh, there's not a single Indigenous kid in the whole school. It's a French immersion school. Uh, and our handler, I wish I remember his name, but he starts doing the welcoming song. Entire school sings the welcoming song in the lower couch and are that indigenous language. Then no, no, no. I couldn't believe it. I remember like looking over at the illustrator and I just get I get shivers uh, to this day because of how powerful it was. And even the impact that it had on the non indigenous illustrator in that moment, I mean that's the benchmark. You know, we sing our songs now here in community and I think about that all the time. And you know, we sing the same songs and we have been for years because we want people to learn them. And what we're seeing is not only, you know, more people from the community picking up drums and participating in those drumming circles, we're starting to see the community sing those songs as well. I mean, it is, it is crazy. I mean, just think about just that moment in, in, in where we want to be. Uh, I think, um, you know, just that lesson alone and that experience alone makes those books worthwhile and we have a bunch more that we want to do just <laughs> need to find the time <laughs> that's fantastic and i think it goes to the benefits of sharing a culture that maybe people haven't had the opportunity to learn about previously and it does seem like people they just want something deeper um it feels like some of maybe the most popular music doesn't have that much meaning. Some of the most common TV shows don't have that much meaning. People seem to be really hungry for something that has a deeper meaning, that has a connection to something that's 10,000 years old, is a good way to start to immerse yourself in what role do I play? Where am I from? What are my traditions? What are my values? And that's been one of my favorite parts about conversations about reconciliation is that people are able to say, wow, you do that. Our culture, my culture does this. And you're able to start to see that we're all a lot more similar than I think people realize. We have overlaps. Um, Christian belief systems, they have flood stories. Indigenous cultures have flood stories. Some of the underlying values that exist in these cultures are connected in a beautiful way that it doesn't take away to say one culture knows this and one culture knows that, and they're a little bit different. The beauty is that there's something underneath them that really means something to people. Oh, I agree with you 100%. I mean, it puts it into perspective, you know, the history and legacy of Indigenous peoples and how we're seeing this crazy revitalization. Everyone is starting to become, you know, a lot more prouder and show more pride in who they are and where they come from. But you know, in that, in the education that's happened over the last couple of decades, is that we're also bringing along those non-Indigenous and in, in trying to have them stand beside us and hold us up and, and be a part of that journey. Because, I mean, we're, we all live in the same world nowadays, you know, in us getting educated on who we are and where we come from and what it means to be an Indigenous person what it means to be from Squatmulu for me, from the Williams Lake First Nation. I mean, we're, we need to make sure that, that they're educated on that too so they, so they can be there. Um, because, again, we're not removing the non-Indigenous people from our territories. We got to live in, live in harmony nowadays. That's just the reality of the world we live in. So. Um, I couldn't agree more. I'd... I think religion or religious beliefs, values, culture, they, they're not just good stories. They give us something when the storm comes, when the flood comes, when problems arise, when the unthinkable happens. They give you something to hold on to during those dark times. And your community has faced that more than, more than most in recent years. Um, you had the St. Joseph's Mission Residential School recoveries. You faced... Uh, a variety of different uh, atmospheric events uh, that impacted you. Can you talk about how your community has fared? How did you approach that as a leader? 
mean, those aren't easy discussions to have by any means. Uh, St. Joseph's Mission it operated, I think, till 82 or 83. So not that long ago. Uh, it was located six kilometers from the community core of WLFN. And it was not only WLFN kids, but uh, kids from the neighboring Sequetman communities, uh, the Chilcotin communities, the, the Geff communities, New Hall, Statlium. And what are we at? I think we're at 48 indigenous communities that have been impacted that had kids that went to that school. You know, here we are, it's located in the heart, you know, in the stewardship area of WLFN. So we've been tasked with taking the lead on the investigative works. It really shows the, um, you know, the, the quality of the people that we have at WLFN and how we've been able to approach that investigation, you know, make sure that we're holding all of the nations up best of our ability and leading with ceremony and, and providing a safe space for people to tell their story. Uh, you know, like we had the, the prime minister of Canada come to our community after we released the findings on January 25th last year. And, and we got a lot of heat for it. You know, how could you be hosting that man, and, you know, F Trudeau and, and, and all of these, you know, anti-vaxxer. I mean, you, 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 you look at situations like that and, and my rebuttal to all those, you know, comments and critiques is that the prime minister came to the res, you know, <laughs> yeah, ain't no other prime minister ever come to our res. And uh, it was, it was through, uh, through teachings and lessons from other leadership that, you know, we were able to embrace that happening where, you know, you talk to a, a very, very well-respected leader in Cadmus Delorme from Calasis First Nation. You know, he reached out right away when he heard the prime minister was coming and his words of advice right away were, make sure that you show him in this country how proud of the people you are, you know, how strong and resilient the people you are and make sure that you make that impact so that he remembers who the Williams Lake First Nation is when he continues on in his travels. You know, the amount of healing that's happening in your community in this moment in time, the amount of healing that has happened in your community to this date, even though you have the history and legacy of, of, of that school right in your backyard. And I always think about that as, as, as we move forward. You know, it's, it's one thing to take a heavy-handed approach and... and say the things that make good news in in the press uh but I, I i think in in the broader discussion of reconciliation and the broader discussion of healing as a country we need to always make sure that you know in in times of need in times of disaster uh in times of traumatic uh, events however you want to term it that we are projecting you know, this hope and this healing uh and that has always been our approach. And, and I think the, the way that our team and our council has, has prepared me to, to take that role, it's been a very humbling experience to say the least. Uh, it hasn't been easy, but the, uh, the amount of support that we have, not only in our council and our staff, but in our elders group and in our cultural leaders and leadership you know, from the region, uh, always checking in and checking up our, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to handle it on my own. And, and, and that's, that's saying something because, uh, some heavy duty stuff, but, but again, I mean, there, we always want to turn these situations in, in, into something that people are going to remember and, and people are going to, you know, use and it, it was, as a beacon of hope in their communities. I look at, you know, our investigative works around St. Joseph's and in the discussions that we continue to have with the other lead communities, not only in BC, but across Western Canada. And it's, it's that information sharing in the way that we've been able to do things that have helped those other communities along as well and vice versa. You know, uh, the interesting thing is all these investigations aren't the same, you know, with us, we're dealing with a bunch of private property owners, uh, with. Kamloops Indian Band, the Kamloops, they have uh, that residential school right on reserve, so it's a little bit different. And and and, and really, you know, as long as we're information sharing, as long as we're 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 talking about, you know, what's working and and what's not working, it's only going to I think 
you know, allow us all to be a little bit stronger moving forward. And then when announcements are made and, and we're, we're having ceremony here in our community and sending our, our prayers and our thoughts in, in, in our strength to those other communities. I mean, that's what we want to see right across the board. Uh, revitalization is key. Unity is also key. I couldn't agree more. I often give the analogy that the way a tree gets stronger is not by not facing strong winds and storms. It's actually the way that it gets stronger because the roots dig in deeper during those those difficult periods and it can be heavy. The topics can be heavy, but it's how communities strengthen that social fabric, understand each other better. When we're busy infighting over that person got a new house or that person's getting repairs before me, we start to infight. But when we're able to catalyze together and work together and support each other, it, it creates deeper bonds and it creates a stronger, more resilient community. And I think you're just a testament to the ability to kind of lead those conversations in a more healthy way so that there, there's an example to look at on how to do this in a better way. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask... I mean, you've got so much going on in your, your community, in your area. You've got the Kakuli Cafe. You've got some really cool entrepreneurship. You've also got um, the first BC, um, first farm to gate cannabis operation. Can you tell us about some of the great things that are going on in terms of growth for your community, in terms of diversifying that economy? Yeah, well, we don't have a Kakuli Cafe yet. I mean, we would love, to have, I mean, we've been in good, some uh, great discussions with Elijah, the, the founder of the. Uh, are one of the franchise owner, one of the entrepreneur, one of the best entrepreneurs and in, indigenous entrepreneurs in the, in the province. Um, but we haven't been able to to lock him down. We are building a restaurant though, so I mean, maybe there's some synergies that are still in uh, those discussions. Uh, yeah, cannabis. We we talk about this resource based economy, Williams Lake, and we're always talking about how we diversify that economy. You know, cannabis was legalized in 2018. And we started discussions with the community around developing a cannabis law right away. You know, we're a land code community, so we're under the First Nations land management regime, which means we have the ability to create laws over reserve lands. And uh, the interesting part of that is those early stages of our cannabis discussions with the community and those how those engagement meetings went, full support. I thought that was really cool. You know, it was classified as a medicine uh, in our community's eyes, which, you know, I kind of take, took me aback because, you know, growing up around it, you know, having the stigma around cannabis, around marijuana, around weed, uh, it, it was, it was interesting to see how the community was in full support of us moving forward and creating a lot and getting into the industry. So our original vision was to get into retail with, you know, down the road, getting into, uh, cultivation and, we were able to negotiate the first government to government agreement around cannabis retail in, our, in the country, uh, which, you know, there has been a handful since in British Columbia, at least And every province is different because the provinces are handing the retail component of this legalization. And right now we have a store in Williams Lake. Uh, we have a store in Penticton. We have a store in Lackawash and we have a store in Merritt all under the Unity brand. I wish I would have worn my Unity shirt today. Uh, Nakusum is how you say it in, in Sequentum. And we've seen a ton of success and there's been a ton of jobs. So as, as we've seen this build out of our, you know, our retail experience around cannabis, uh, and, and, you know, working with the province of British Columbia and continuing to gripe on them about, you know, how much they take off the top in this legal world super frustrating but you know the industry is continuing to evolve eventually we're going to get there where uh i think there's going to be more benefits to indigenous communities being in the space to moving into this cultivation experience around farm to gate so farm to gate seed to sale we grow it in the back we sell it up the front getting our health canada license and being certified and, and really owning every phase of, 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 of you know legal cannabis distribution growing uh, has been a journey on its own. It's where we've gotten a ton of profile. I mean, we have a lot of jobs in the form. I mean, what are we at now? I think we're over 40 jobs now, including our retail and our cultivation. And those are, you know, majority of which are 
are, are held by indigenous people from our community and from the communities that we're, that we're working in. I mean, that's pretty, pretty special in, in an, an industry that had this crazy stigma and still has a bit of stigma around, you know, how bad it is you know, we're seeing the majority of the clientele that are coming into our stores, you know, they utilize it actually as a medicine, you know, for their ailments and as an alternative to the over the counter drugs that they can get at the pharmacy. You know, and the the success that we've seen has been it's been great. It's been super exciting. It's an exciting industry to be in. But there's a ton of work to do on the provincial, on the federal level around, you know, giving indigenous communities a chance to succeed in the space. I mean, the amount of taxes that come off the top that go back to the government and how, how we're not seeing any breaks there uh, is, is a big part of it. The amount of competition that we see against the, I guess, non-regulated or sovereignty communities or um, gray market communities uh, that really impact us in, in, in areas like Penticton, for example, and then the competition around even the, the actual licensed facilities. A big part of why we moved into that legal space and didn't didn't go down that gray market route was we wanted to make sure that we could open up a bank account, big one. Uh, I remember talking to a guy who's living in that gray market world, and I'm like, "What do you do with all the money?" And he's like, "Honestly, I put it in boxes, and I'm running out of places to hide it, Willie, uh, because you can't legally open a bank account if you're not, you know, legally uh, licensed to sell." Uh, Insurance, obviously a big one, making sure that, you know, we are covered if something were to happen, uh, making sure that there's a Health Canada certified product on the shelves, uh, and that people aren't getting sick, you know, um, I mean, those are, those are, those are massive ones. Keeping out, uh, organized crime, I mean, being able to actually pay our staff uh, through our bank account and improve provide you know a benefit opportunity for them if, if they want to buy into that too i mean these are all key things but you know the debate on gray market sovereignty model in the legal space and indigenous communities is a big one but what we continue to say you know out to the provincial and federal government is just you know you need to evolve quicker the legislation is just so damn slow around the evolution of cannabis and indigenous communities and making more benefits so that they do come over uh, is a key part of that. But again, every community is different, and uh, you have to respect the decision of those communities and how they want to approach these things. And although our model, in our opinion, is the best model, it um, <laughs> it's a model that works for for, for us, and that's so what we continue to say as we speak at conferences or speak to leadership and educate them on on how our journey has been. But I've went from an individual who uh, knew nothing about cannabis, and in my opinion, still doesn't know a ton, uh, to the general public. We are experts. <laughs> we are experts in the in in the cannabis scene. It's been fun. For <laughs> probably an understatement, it's been, a, it's been extremely fun. It really excites me because I think it's a statement to various levels of government. There might be some hesitation over the years of like, we're trying to consult, would you be open to this? Does it interest you? And then you kind of get like whispers or crickets and you don't get that same hunger. But when you see some, a community like yourself taking the lead and really showing that you can sit at the table, that you can have better policy ideas, you can have the background of this is why this is gonna work better. Then they go, oh, wow, we need to get these thoughts more. And it, it excites and it, it creates that spark for people to go, no, we're not just doing it because we have to consult. We're going to consult because we want some good ideas and they may have knowledge that we, we're not privy to and they have strategies and understandings. Like, I think that that's really important. It changes the conversation, the dialogue that you're having, and that excites me a lot. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's it's been an interesting space around even... You know, educating ourselves and creating these really cool brands and strains, or this really cool brand in Unity and sugar cane cannabis, but then also being able to grow these like strains and and have them out, have like an indigenous feel to them. Like I I, I just grabbed some stickers and and you look, it's like you know uh, our grass dance brand. Yeah. We, have, we have flower and pre rolls and and 
just the indigenous feel to that and how we've been able to successfully brand it and see success and see that product in products like Medicine Man, for example. There you go. In provincial stores. That's I mean, awesome. I mean, it's so crazy. Yeah. But people in the north or in the south are able to buy our product. And um, it's because of all the work that we've been able to do and how we've been able to grow a strain that, that, that you know, is of high THC content and how we've been able to build this relationship and, and see them purchase it and put it in that indigenous shelf space in the provincial store is crazy. That's so crazy. Can you tell can you tell people how they can get your books? Um can you say the names again so people know where to go looking for them? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon or in chapters, uh or maybe they carry it at a local bookstore, but you could order it um, at your local bookstore. Uh it's hockey with dad and dip knitting with dad. Uh in the years to come, I think our next two titles are gonna be powwow with dad and uh hunting with dad wow so i mean we kept it with the dad theme just for branding purposes but you know of course like mom will take a bigger role in future books and grandma um i mean it's all about that family center i've had another child since too so like i'm gonna have to uh start introducing more family characters somehow some way you know to keep all the kids happy in my life there we go. It's an A and W run, eh? Yeah, yeah. We'll have we'll have something for every every walk of life, and that's a, that's a cool thing too. I mean, you look at you know how important hunting is in indigenous communities and indigenous culture. Well, how do you portray? And this was always a debate that I had with my publisher: is how do you portray the killing of an animal uh, like a deer or a moose to an audience of three to seven? <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty impossible, but I think pretty necessary. Yeah. Uh, I always said when I was always lobbying for that hunting with dad book that, um, you know, any press is good press. Then I probably should probably disagree with that, but you know, uh, we've got uh, a privilege to, to, to move forward with those ones, uh, through our lead agent and, uh, yeah, really looking forward to getting those on the shelves in the years to come. It's all about just the process of writing them and uh, and getting the illustrator on board to complete the illustrations. And it's exciting times in Indian country, not just for local entrepreneurs like yourself and and, and like myself, but leadership in communities and the amount of uptake that we're seeing, the amount of support that we're seeing, not only from the feds, from our premier, uh, and from our local municipalities and, and CRDs and how they embrace the concept of reconciliation and include us in those discussions and, and all the things that they're doing as well. But we've never seen that, you know? I mean, I, I say it's exciting times, like it should have happened years ago, but it didn't. But it's happening now in our era. And, and young leaders like yourself and myself are, are, are getting those seats at the table and having those discussions. And, you know, for the future of our communities and the health and wellness of our communities, you couldn't, you couldn't ask for a better opportunity or to be in these positions to actually be able to make that change. So you know, excited to, to share our story, share my story, and just, just be a part of it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think th our generation is definitely putting the the politics, putting the, the complaining and the frustration, and that came from a real place. Like, I'm not uh, speaking ill of those individuals. They were banging on the door and not getting through, and now the door is open, and our feeling is just like, well, let's just go on in and let's start to make some progress. And I love that energy. I'm so glad that people like yourself are producing these books because... The question I get asked a lot is like, how do I get involved in reconciliation? And my dream, my uh, pie in the sky is that one day you won't have to ask because that book will be in the store when you're shopping. The food will be in your supermarket. There will be opportunities for you to connect with our culture in an easy, accessible way that you don't have to go scouring the internet to try and find something. It will be right there. And you're an individual really contributing to that. I find you really inspirational because you're you're leaving all of that, that politics to the side and you just want to make things better and that really excites me it gets me very motivated so i really appreciate you being willing to come on today um i think you have so much wisdom and experience and humility about the work you do putting it on your staff i think that sets the example for people we get lost in wanting to to 
be successful or, or whatever that looks like for somebody, you're very much willing to put that back on the team um, and be proud of the work that everybody's doing together to make people's lives better. Oh, man, I'm so thankful for you know, people like you that help us share these stories because, you know, without these stories, nobody would, would know. And, you know, this is an education process for, for, for everyone. Just, again, uh, keep doing what you're doing, man, because uh, it's looking good and, and everyone is right there with you. Well, I wish you the best of luck tonight. It sounds like it's going to be a, a beautiful ceremony. Um, I hope the food is fantastic. Uh, I just uh, really appreciate you being willing to uh, to take this time. I think there's a lot for people to get out of this. And huge thank you to Tim, if we can uh, switch the camera to him. Thank you so much, Tim, for putting this together. Uh, how did we do? Everything looks and sounds great. Awesome. Cool. I tried to continue to look um, at Aaron in the top square and not look anywhere else. So hopefully that helped. <laughs> you did a really good job. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, you no, are very insightful. It sounded fantastic and <laughs> super thrilled. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you in person one of these times. I look forward to it. If uh, if I'm up there, I'll definitely send you an email. And if you're down here, let me know. Okay, sounds good.